Well, it's a joy to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Ethan Sandusky. I am the new student pastor here at Emmanuel. I have been here a whopping three months. Um, and David and Mark are not here, which puts me in charge, which is either terrifying or really exciting. Um, I think a little column A, a little column B. Uh, but I am absolutely thrilled to get to be up here, get to preach. It's always a joy when I get to, to preach to adults. Um, not that I don't like preaching to teenagers, but... Uh, it's always nice to, for you to get to know me and I get to know y'all a little bit better. Um, but man, I just love what Denny had to say. As we conclude 2020, what a year this has been. I don't think anyone's going to be sorry to see it go. I don't think anyone would argue that this has been a tough year for many. We have seen people lose their jobs. We have seen people face loneliness and anxiety and depression, and this is evident in seeing our suicide rates go through the roof. Antidepressant pills and anti-anxiety medication are being prescribed at an alarming rate, three times the rate of previous years. We have seen people lose loved ones. Christmas Eve was, was a hard night for me. We got home from Christmas Eve service and I got a call from an executive pastor of the church that we just left in, in Texas. And he said, hey, I don't know how to tell this, but one of your students' moms just died. Passed away from COVID. I spent the next 30 to 45 minutes on the phone with him, just weeping with him. Or with the loss of his mother. This has been a hard year. It's been an awful year for many. And as Christians, we don't oftentimes know what to do with our pain. We don't know what to do with suffering because we think that because we are Christians, we shouldn't feel this way. We were given a CD when the girls were little of, you know, kid, kid worship songs. And it's got this song. I, I hate this song so much. But it's, it's, it's got this phrase that says, I'm in right outright, upright, downright, happy all the time since Jesus Christ came in. And it's awful because it just, it just goes over and over and over and over and over again. But that is how we are to feel. Because Jesus Christ is in us, we are to be happy all the time. And that is such a lie. Happiness is fleeting. There is a difference from our call to be joyful and a call to be happy. We are not called to be happy all the time. So as Christians, we must ask, what are we to do with sorrow and pain and suffering? And it oftentimes is difficult to look at the scriptures and say, well, what does the scriptures have to say about this? Well, hopefully this morning, we will walk away with a better understanding with how Christians should deal with pain and suffering. So if you would, go ahead and open up to the book of Psalms. We're going to be in Psalms 42 and 43. And as you turn there, I want to talk a little bit about the book of Psalms um, and, and, and some beliefs that we have about it. When you hear Psalms, a lot of times you think happy thoughts. This is a great book with uplifting songs of poetry, praising our Lord. And you would be absolutely correct. Those things are in there. But there are other categories as well. You see, because there's 150 different songs and poems in the book of Psalms. And 54 of them, over a third, are songs of lamentation and sorrow. And I believe that we can learn from these psalms. We can learn how to take our pain and suffering to God in a way that magnifies him. So let's read the scriptures and we'll pray and we'll see what it looks like to take our sorrow to the Lord. Psalm 42, he says this. He says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with a throng and lead them in procession to the house of God 
with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, and therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and the Mount of Mizar. Deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go on mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bone, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and the unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? Send out your light and your truth and let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God to, um, to God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the lyre, O oh God, my God. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that as we look at your scriptures and see what it has to say about sorrow and despair, Father, Lord, I pray that you would envelop this room with your wings of mercy, Father. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our eyes so that we may see your truth. I pray that you would prepare our ears so that we may hear it and prepare our hearts so that we may receive it. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we have read this psalm of sorrow, this psalm of lamentation, we can see that its author is going through a difficult time. You don't say that your tears have been your food day and night if you are going through joyous times. So we can see that this author is troubled. He is in despair. He is mourning. And the really cool thing about this, just like the other songs of Lamentation, we don't know the story behind the psalm. And I think that is wonderful for us because it allows us to come to this and say, I could sing this song. This song fits my situation so I can take my sorrow to God in the same way that this author did. And so as we go to this psalm, we're going to see four elements, four ways that this psalm, this song is a proper lamentation. And we can take these things and we can apply them to our own lives and we are struggling with how to take our sorrow and sadness and despair and darkness to God. We can use them to write our own songs of lamentation. So let's see here. What is the first element of a proper lamentation? Well, a proper lament remembers. Let's look at Psalm 42, 4. The author says this. He says, these things I remember. Well, we immediately need to stop and to begin to clarify this statement because things doesn't have a very clear modifier. So what exactly is he remembering? Well, some people may argue that he is remembering the bad things that are around him. Well, I disagree. I disagree because if we look at the text, he says this. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. So we can see that he is remembering better days. He is remembering a time where he was not feeding on his tears. He remembers a time where he felt close to God. 
Because one thing that's almost a universal truth is when we are in a pit of darkness, we feel distant from God. We can sometimes feel separated from him. And so we see that a proper lament remembers there were better days, remembers that there was once a time where we were the first ones in line to sing the praises of God. And there is a desire in the psalmist's heart to say, I want to return to those days. I want to return to the better days when I felt close with God, when I couldn't wait to go to church, when I couldn't wait to praise you because you were right there with me. So we see that this is the beginning place, that a a place remembers where we remember that there were better days. Next, we see that a proper lament can ask why. Let's look at 42 verse nine. He says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? And why do I go on mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? So we see that the psalmist here, he's going to God and saying, why God? Why is this happening? Why do I feel abandoned? Why do I go on being oppressed? Why do I go on mourning? And I think this is important to understand because I think a lot of times as Christians, we don't ever feel like we can go to God and ask that question, why? And we have to be willing to. But notice, he does not cross a line into accusation. He says, God, why is this happening? He does not say, God, you are at fault for my troubles. You are at fault for my pain. No, he says, God, why is this happening? And you will usually get three different answers if he chooses to answer you. But sometimes God doesn't, and that's a hard time. But he is still good. But our three answers that we can get is one, we are in sorrow and in suffering because of the sin of someone else. A common scenario, it'd be in a case of abuse, where abuse has brought pain and suffering and darkness and despair into someone's life. And that has been brought into their life by the, by the sin of someone else. So they are not responsible for the situation that they are in, but however, they are responsible for the way in which they respond to it. So we see that we may be in a pit of despair because of someone else that sinned against us. One that's a little bit more common is our own personal sin. We have sin in our lives that has, that has led us into a situation that has brought in pain and suffering. It reminds me of uh, the story in 1 Corinthians where Paul writes to the Corinthians, says, you got a guy coming to your church who is sleeping with his father's wife. This is unacceptable. This does not line, put in line with the, with, the, with the walk of a Christian. And so what does Paul do? Paul says, cast him out, stop hanging out with him. And then he goes one step further. He says, pray that the Lord would remove his hand of protection from this man. Why did Paul do this? Out of spite? No. Because he didn't like him? No. But because he knew that this man would need to face the discipline of the Lord so that he may return to a faithful walk with Christ. The purpose of God's discipline and the purpose of pain and suffering is to turn us back to God. So we see we could be be in a situation because of our own sin. And then finally... Sin in general. When Adam and Eve chose to commit that first sin, they ruined everything. They broke it. It's not fair because we didn't eat that apple, but yet we are still feeling the ramifications of sin that broke this world. It broke the world. The reason we have death, sin. The reason we have pain, sin. The reason that COVID-19 exists, sin. Sin broke this world and it made it in need of a savior. We are allowed to go to God and say, why is this happening? Why are we here? And you will usually get one of these three answers. Well, where do we go from those answers? One, we move to the next part. We see a proper lament 
remembers who God truly is. You see, when we are facing times of darkness and struggle, we are oftentimes vulnerable. Be able to be deceived, be lied to. The evil one can come to us and whisper lies in your ear. And like what the psalmist has said, he says, I am constantly being oppressed by people looking at me and saying, where's your God? If God truly loved you, he wouldn't be letting you go through this. We would be facing these kinds of lies and difficulties all the time. And we can sometimes turn God into something that he's not. A little boy playing with a magnifying glass burning ants. It's funny, but a lot of people think that's who God is. And that could not be further from the truth. So these two psalms together are 16 verses. And 17 different times the psalmist reflects on the truth of who God is. I'm going to show you five of them, and then I'll let you find the other 12, and we'll have a test at the end of the message. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, but we're going to look at just five of these because we could spend here two hours just going through these and talking about the depth and the weight and the beauty of how the psalmist has reflected upon these. Well, let's just kind of move through these really quickly. In Psalm 42, 2, he says, my soul thirsts for God, the living God. He begins this way. He says, I am in turmoil. I am in pain. I am suffering. But the greatest thirst of my soul is for you, not for alleviation of my situation. I want to know you because you are the living God. You are not dead. You are not in a ground. You are not a graven image made of wood or metal. No, you are the living God who hung the stars in the sky and created the earth. And that's how he begins of recognizing that the God that he serves is the living God. As he continues, he says in verse 42, verse 8, he says, he is the giver of songs in the night. We can look at this and say, well, yeah, we can sing at night. But no, I think this is a metaphor of singing in times of darkness. And as I read this, I immediately thought to Paul and Barnabas. In the book of Acts, what, are they, what, what happens to them? They get arrested for sharing the gospel. And they are in chains and in prison. And I can imagine it would be really easy to get bitter at God in that moment. And saying, God, I was being obedient. I was doing what you asked me to do. I was out here spreading the gospel so that your name may be made glorious. And now I'm in prison? I imagine that could be a really easy way, place to be. But no, what do they do? They sing a song of joy because they had joy in their hearts because who he was. So God was able to give them a song in the midst of their night. And then how's that story end? What an earthquake comes, breaks their chains, and then the jailer and his entire family are one to the kingdom of God. What an amazing story. Let's keep going. Verse 42, uh, chapter 42, verse 9. He says to this, he says, to God, my rock. He is reflecting upon the steadfastness, the steadiness of God. I imagine there were times in this man's life that he felt like everything in his life was crashing down around him. And yet he recognized that the foundation on which he stood upon was God and he was a rock that would never fail him. Do we recognize in times of sorrow and heartache that the rock upon which we stand will never crumble and will never fade away and will never disappoint us? Do we reflect on that like he did? What else does he say? Verse, uh, uh, chapter 43, verse 1, he says, Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people from the deceitful and the unjust man. Deliver me. He's appealing to God's justice. He's appealing to God's righteousness. He says, I know that you are a good God full of justice and righteousness. Would you bring that forward now? I briefly mentioned abuse earlier, and there are many people who have been abused that, the, that our legal system has failed them egregiously. But we can look at our God and say, you will not fail me. You will vindicate me and you will make all things right. He's reflecting upon the God's justice. 
And then he says in verse 3 of chapter 43, he says, Send out your light and your truth and let them lead me. What a profound statement he makes. Because he is looking for a path. He is looking for a solution to his problem. And what does he ask for? God's truth and God's light. He says, let those things lead me. And where do they lead him? To God's presence. You see, he understands that even in the midst of heartache and sorrow and turmoil, the absolute best place that he could be is in the dwelling place of the Lord and sitting in his presence. So we see that this psalmist, through this song of heartache and tears, he is constantly appealing to the God who is, the God who is real, and the God who loves him and will never abandon him. And in our time, we can feel so abandoned by God that we forget who he truly is. In our darkness, we must constantly be telling ourselves who God is and that our circumstances do not change who his scriptures say he is. Our world can be crumbling down around us. We could lose everything and God would still be good. It reminds me of somewhere else. Another psalmist writes this. This is a hard year for a number of people. People have lost people. August, we were supposed to have another baby. We lost that baby earlier this year. And that was a hard time for us. It was a difficult time for us. But God constantly brought these verses to my mind. He says this in Psalm 73. He says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. And my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Our little baby failed. My hope was not in that child. My student who's in Texas lost his mom. His mom failed. She ultimately could not be his hope. She ultimately could not be his salvation. She failed. I'm not saying that she's a bad mom, but she passed away at an untimely time. But are we constantly reminding ourselves that the best thing in our lives is to be in the presence of God? And are we saying that there is nothing on this earth that I desire more than you? Is that the desire of our hearts? Because if it is not, then our lament will never come to a proper ending. Because we see that a proper lamentation ends in hope in God. When an author repeats something in literature, they want you to remember it. When an author repeats something in literature, they want you to remember it. <laughs> um, so we see as we conclude in this message, we see that this, uh, the psalmist repeats three times this very interesting phrase. He says it first in Psalm 42.5. He says, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He says it again in verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you at turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And then he concludes 43 the same way. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And I love that he does this because there are times in my life when I am struggling and I am going through hard times and I have to remind myself of who God is. And then five minutes later, I have to do it again. And then five minutes later, I have to do it again because we have to constantly combat the thoughts that are unfaithful and ungodly and disobedient to him. 
We have to combat it with the truth of who he is. And now what is he is not saying, why are you cast down? Go and put a smile on and put on a brave face so that you can save face. No, that is not at all what he is saying. He says, soul, why are you cast down? And why are you in turmoil? Because ultimately you know who is in control and that is God and you will once again praise him. He is your salvation. Put your hope in him. As we conclude this year, we've, we've heard rumors of a second stimulus. We have heard, we have heard uh, promises from politicians. We have heard promises from medical corporations. And we, there are many in this world who are looking to these things for salvation and for hope. And these things will fail them. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but they are not lasting. They will fail them. And as Christians, we need to understand that our sorrow and our pain ends at the cross. Hope in him who saves you. And this is not an easy task. This is not an easy task at all but it is doable through the power of the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit. So you may be asking, how do I take the song like this and apply it to my situation? Well, I think we just move through it in the same way. Are you in the midst of your darkness remembering the better days? Are you remembering the times when you felt close with God? Are you inquiring to your God, saying, God, I am miserable, I am oppressed, I am in a pit of darkness, why am I here? Because God teaches us just as much through the dark as it is through the light. I'm, I, I, if, you, if you spend much time around me, you, you'll, you'll know that I am a huge Bob Ross nerd. I love Bob Ross. He's got a nice way of talking. Um, and I, 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 I like to listen to him. Like what I'll do is I, if I'm doing sermon prep in my office, I'll get on YouTube, I'll open up a Bob Ross thing and then I'll turn it down and then I'll just do sermon prep because I, I, I like to listen to the way he paints. But he would say this saying over and over and over again when he was making a color contrast between a light and a dark and he would say a lot of times that we have to have dark to recognize how good the light is. And I, I, I don't know the nature of Bob's soul. I don't know if he was a Christian. But I think about that statement and I'm like, when I look at the darkness of this world, how much more beautiful does that make the light of Christ seem? Right? And in our lives, are we remembering a time when we weren't in darkness and do we need to run back towards the light? Are we remembering who God truly is? Are we taking time in our day to meditate on the truth of God's word and saying, he is my rescuer, he is my redeemer. In another place in Psalms, it says, he is my help in ever present times of trouble. Are we meditating on that? And then finally, are we placing our hope in the right thing? Are we hoping in God to rescue us? Or are we putting our hope in something else? Because as Christians, our hope can only be placed in the blood of Christ. Well, as Denny and Rocky come to conclude our service with, with a time of invitation, I will be down here at the front and if you need someone to pray with you through a time of turmoil, I would be more than willing to do that. But maybe, maybe there are some of us in our, that just need to come to the altar and bring our sorrows to God. Maybe we've never felt that we could do that. And I pray that if you took nothing else away from this, that this psalm gives you permission to come to the throne of grace in tears and in brokenness, putting your hope in the only one who can put you back together. So as we go to the Lord, maybe you need to come to the altar. Maybe you just need some prayer. Let's go to the Lord.